Good evening, I'm Matt Wojcik, the Town Administrator. I'm going to call the meeting of the Douglas Select Board to order shortly after 7 o'clock sharp on Tuesday, March 12th. Um, the Board is holding a full reorganization, so it is the tradition that the Town Administrator preside over that section. All agenda items will be postponed until after the Board reorganizes, with the exception of the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please stand? <coughs> So there's sometimes confusion about Robert's Rules of Order and the reorganization of a committee. Just go over a couple of things. The nomination for office. Uh, does not require a second to leave the floor open until all nominations are received once the floor is closed. Um, <clears throat> if there is no debate, you move immediately to a vote. But you may decide to speak if you decide to speak. Um, so at this time, uh, the chairmanship of the Douglas Select Board being vacant, I'm asking for nominations. I'll nominate Mike Fitzpatrick. Are there any other nominations? I'll nominate Mike Fitzpatrick also. We don't need a second, but we've got two nominations, which has the same effect. <laughs> Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, is there any discussion? With that, we'll put it to a vote. The only nomination on the floor is for Mike Fitzpatrick to serve as chair. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Mr. Chairman, your meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the uh, support. What we're going to do now is take nominations for the uh, vice chair's position. Do I have any uh, nominations? After some thought of this position, uh, with who we've got sitting here, I. I feel uh, the younger view uh, would benefit the board, so I'm going to uh, nominate Maxwell. Do we have any other nominations? With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we're going to bounce around a little bit. Um, on the agenda, the first thing, uh, because we have a uh, little bit of a conflict, so Matt's going to be jumping back and forth from Finance Committee meeting to this one. So I'm going to go right to number three, which will be uh, ratifying the um, contract for the Assistant Fire Chief, Kelly Manning. You can take up two, if you don't mind, because Mr. Birch is here. And okay. So if you don't mind waiting, I'd like to meet the, uh, if you don't mind waiting 30 seconds, Kelly, I'm going to uh, <coughs> go back to number two. Um, Mr. Birch, would you like to join us? Yeah. <clears throat> so the second item is the uh, Conservation Commission appointment um, for Mr. Birch. Uh, for the sake of transparency, I'm going to recuse myself on this. It happens to be my son's father-in-law. So your first official duty, Mr. Vice Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind holding my hand through this? <laughs> While you're gathering, I'll ask a couple questions, and maybe the other board members will as well. So. The administrator doesn't review these applications. Oh, the board do you does. have my application? I think so. Um, that was previously on uh, two other town boards. Um, I was on the open space committee and um, for a number of years, and then I was appointed to uh, uh, the planning board to fill out an 11-month term. Um, that was probably about 15 years ago. And uh, that's it. 
So from your professional background, do you have exposure to conservation issues and wetlands protection? Um, from some of my real estate background, yeah, I, um, I, I'm aware of um, uh, some of the rules for conservation, wetland, um, you know, how far you can build from wetland, stuff like that. Um, and, um, and when I was on the planning board, I, um, I did um, take a class for Robert's Rules of, uh, of, of Order. So um, the town paid for it, too. Um, <laughs> it was nice. It was up at uh, Holy Cross. And uh, it was a nice class, so. Uh, are you generally comfortable with the frame of mind it requires to hold people accountable to written plans that have been submitted and enforce the things that they promised to do through the conservation agency? Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, um, want the town's best interests. Um, and, uh, yeah. Do we have a motion to appoint uh, Mr. Birch to the Conservation Committee? I'll make a motion to appoint Joseph Birch to be so, Josiah. Josiah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> Josiah Birch yeah. uh, to a full member position of the Conservation Committee. It, um, sorry, it's an alternate. 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 Seconded. Alternate. So the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Congratulations. Oh, thank you. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll be in touch, Joe. Sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Okay, Gal, we're back. <laughs> Uh, we're going to move on to number three, which is to ratify the contract for Assistant Fire Chief Kelly Manning. So last time, uh, this was on our agenda last time, and I actually raised a question um, on the contract. Uh, for the sake of the board, I did have a couple different conversations with the town administrator to give me a different view, um, or from his standpoint, what his thoughts were on this, <clears throat> to try to help me get my head around it. Um, the, and the biggest thing, and and it is nothing else other than what, and I blame Matt to his face, uh, what Matt and the Finance Committee had drummed into my head is whenever we have to do anything or buy anything in town, the first question you need to ask is how is it paid for? So then that gets to the section f um, that I had referred to. Um, there's a stipulation in there, it's under uh, discipline. If you bear with me for a minute, I'll actually find that uh, section. So it's under section eight. Um, and the question that I had uh, was in the event that if there was a termination by the town and a and the such uh, the termination was subsequently vacated, reversed or modified, the employee would have the option to either a lump sum severance equal to the balance of the salary benefits cost fees to be paid according to this agreement and then some remaining term of this agreement for the, for the then son uh, remaining term of this agreement but in no less than 12 months salary of benefits or could reinstate into the position. I don't anticipate this ever happening. I just, I don't see it. Um, I'm not worried about that. It's not even a concern of mine at all. Um, my concern is, is if, like I explained at the last meeting, we get two years, 11 months, 20 days into it, and something goes sideways, how do we pay for that 12 months? That's what my biggest concern was. Um, Matt, the town administrator, had an explanation for me that somewhat satisfied it. 
I don't want to cause any more grief over this than what's already been caused over it. I guess uh, at this point, uh, like I did on the other things that I was concerned with throughout the process with the town administrator, I conceded to it and allowed it. Out of respect for the uh, fire and the current sitting fire chief, um, I agreed to something that he insisted on. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. So from my standpoint, my concern has been somewhat resolved at this point. I'll let it go. Um, the next time this comes up with the other two contracts, I would prefer, or any contracts, prefer that it goes through the executive session so we can go through the terms of these contracts so then the board would understand what it is we can hash out this and not cause the stress that it causes for everybody involved, uh, whether it's the employee or the, the members of this board. So that's all I got to say on it. I don't know if anybody else has any questions on this particular contract. Um, the hopes are is to resolve this and then we can continue on our work as we all try to do each day. Do you have anything, Tim? Um, <clears throat> sort of motion, uh, not really. No, I just want to just make sure the other two don't have anything and then you can get into your motion if you okay. don't have anything else to add to it. I'm in full understanding of, of the situation. So you're fine with it? I'm okay with it. Okay. Yeah, I've got, I've got no concerns. On track okay. If I want, Tim, I'll send it back to you. If <clears throat> yeah. Matt, are we authorizing you to ratify? Which it appears it's already been... It's already been signed. Yeah. No, so <clears throat> it works the opposite way, right? So this is unique to the lieutenant's contract and the second-in-command at the fire department's contract. These are the only two contracts like this. Uh, actually, I take that back. The chiefs, by operation of state law, and then these two by operation of local bylaw, the appointing authority makes the appointment, but it is subject to your ratification, your approval. So with that, I'd make a motion that we ratify the contract for our assistant fire chief, uh, Kelly Manning. Motion's been made. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, we have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. With that, Mr. Administrator, is there um, how much time you got? Well, I'm thinking um, I'd be comfortable taking 13 out of order because then we could consolidate some time yep. later. Go ahead. So, so we're going to talk about number 13 is discussion and votes on the employee health insurance rates for fiscal year 25. Mr. Chairman, earlier this week, I circulated to you and to the Finance Committee the actuarial worksheet associated with calculating our rates. And without attempting to even pretend to be an actuary, because it takes many years of training to do that, <clears throat> what the progression of the numbers on the sheet show you is basically the actuary takes our claims experience for the last two years and isolates out those that were catastrophic because they are unlikely to repeat and then applies a market trend to what the number that's left over and then puts back into that experience uh, or forecast uh, the portion of the catastrophic claims that were not covered by stop loss insurance. It's a, just a way to protect the fund from running short. And long story short, um, there were two scenarios run because the board is at this critical nexus point. Um, we, because we are not a fully insured entity, we are a self-insured entity, and we operate through a third party administrator, so another professional outfit is actually administering our claims. We have full insight into what are referred to as pharmacy rebates. The major pharmacy companies pay customers, big customers, employers, or insurance companies, rebates on the cost of a drug that, for all intents and purposes, are rent. They want to be in your formulary. They want to be the drug of choice that 
you as the insurer push your claimants to use. And in exchange for that treatment in the formulary, there's a rebate that comes back. Um, it's a substantial sum of money. So if anybody wonders if their farmer prices are inflated for all kinds of ridiculous reasons, this is one of them, which is the price isn't real because they've already calculated what they need to make and they have a price and they give it back to you if they get what they want, which is basically shelf space mm -hmm. in your store. Um, the group has not been using those funds for anything other than savings. So we've built our surplus in some degree by not allocating those rebates back out to the individual towns that are a member of the group. It just became this, it's not really a common asset, but it just became a source of liquidity in our cash, uh, in our checking account because it's always there. It's not being spent for anything, but it is coming in. It is attributable to each individual town or school district that is a member of our group because it is part of a claim. So if you come in and you say, I'm sick and I take drug X, and drug X has a rebate associated with it, we know that your claim came from a certain town, and we know that your claim is associated with that prescription, so it all can be traced back to the town. In the case of um, five years of history with Douglas, typically about 20% of our pharmacy cost comes back to us in the form of rebates. So we're, we're lowering a very significant portion of our health claims by 20%. That yielded one rate, and then if we did not factor those rebates in, we got another rate. Now, what's interesting here is that when you take our catastrophic claims out, even though utilization of our plan is high, the average claim is small. So we actually end up with two negative numbers. The actuary recommends or would tolerate or uh, w would be comfortable with the town of Douglas actually taking a small rate deduction the, of either 3.9% in the case of what the pharmacy rebates included or negative 0.9%, just about negative 1% if they're not included. Gene and I have had this conversation more than once over the last five years because we have had negative rate recommendations come from the actuary before. In fact, last year the recommendation was a negative 5%. We don't go along with it. We don't recommend that anyone go along with it because that creates ups and downs and the employee is paying 20% of their insurance cost. So one year you're giving them some of their paycheck back, the next year you're taking it back. And it's, it just becomes an uncomfortable way to manage employee, employee relations. So. The board votes the rates of the individual towns. The only thing that will be before them is negative 3.9 or negative 0.9 unless you take a position as a select board and ask for a zero, which is what Gene and I are recommending. This would be the third year in a row that our insurance rates for employees have not gone up, which is pretty extraordinary history. And over the course of the last, this is now our sixth renewal, we're at an average of 1.7%, which is well below the prop two and a half threshold and way below inflation. So we're chuff, chuff, chuffing along in a really healthy way here. At some point in the next two or three weeks, uh, two or three meetings of the select board, I'll be coming to you with a policy because we have signed a joint purchase agreement that requires that if we have more than 10% surplus, we have to take that money out. The idea is, you can't get comfortable with rate passes every single year. You should be paying rates that reflect your claims. And to the extent that you've got a surplus, you should be doing something with it, bringing it back to the town. Gene and I agree this is going to come back as almost like a general fund closure to free cash. We would want a policy to govern how those funds are allocated once it comes back to the town with the notion that even though it isn't mathematically pure, philosophically it's very compelling to say employees contributed 20%, they should get some form of 20% of, of our surplus back into them, their pockets because they are the beneficiary. So that's, that's what we're working on is two things, right? OPEB and the other is how can we lawfully 
bring some of the money back to our employees without violating IRS rules around HSAs and other premium uh, holiday type conversations. Uh, so right now I'm asking you to please support our recommendation to request that the MSHG board uh, give the town of Douglas a rate pass this year or a 0% increase. Does anybody have any questions for town administrator? That was actually pretty good news. <laughs> yeah, it's great. The 20% Matt, what the dollar figure we're looking at? So I'll have to look at where this will close us out this year and what our pharmacy rebates that have accrued. So what is our share of that nest egg that was left there? I'm going to give you a range because I feel most comfortable giving you a range. The town of Douglas's current surplus in the MSHG claims trust fund is somewhere between 1.4 and $2 million. So if we took back, let's say we take back a million, that 200,000 that we would want to allocate back to employees, remember this is the schools too, we'd be looking I'm trying to think of what the HSA, but that would almost be a couple years worth of the town picking up the entire 50% match of an HSA. This is by way of example only, but it is one something I'm thinking very carefully about. We're allowed to do that under IRS rules because the maximum is 4,100 employee co employer contribution to an HSA. We'd be at like 3,000. What that means for our employees, though, is that their entire deductible would be covered by the HSA every year from the town. Right now it's 50-50. Um, that, that makes the benefit in this town very attractive and I don't see it as a recruitment tool, I see it as a retention tool. Because we can talk to our employees who are here already, you are getting a great deal. We are the only town anywhere that's at 20% premium co-share and if we pick up the rest of their HSA, that's pretty spectacular. And, it's limited, right? We can't have it become past practice. We'll have to sit down with all the unions and make sure they sign <laughs> a piece of paper that says this will not be considered past practice for future reference. Um, but I think it's good news for everybody. What we want to do is encourage people to do what this plan was set up to do, which is follow healthy habits. Reduce the cost of the overall claims by following best practices for managing chronic conditions like diabetes and and going out and getting um, care, a second opinion, if you have a significant diagnosis, because we, we support all those things financially. Mm -hmm. And the, to the extent that people are using that, it's really benefiting the overall economics of the group. So it's a very positive loop that we're in. We just want to keep it going. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you have anything? Max? I have one question. <clears throat> My parents get their health care. Should I refuse myself in this vote? No, because the, the vote will affect the entire mm -hmm. class and not just you individually. So ethically, you're not challenged here. Just want to make sure. Yeah. No, thank you. <clears throat> so what you're looking for is a um, motion to um, approve the health care rates with a 0%? To request, to request that the MSHG Board of Directors give Douglas a 0% increase this year. Want to go with that, Tim? Or oh, you want to just say I'm so? so moved. Moved. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Motion's been made. Do I have a second? A second. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks for that work, Matt. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and to the board through you. Uh, that's a very important step for us. I'll be back. Yep. With Gene, hopefully. <laughs> Just want to ask a quick question, Paul and Courtney. Are you here for the BBT discussion? We are not. Okay. Here in case there are any questions about the Warren articles. Okay. Um, so the Warren articles, we're going to wait for Matt and Gene to come back for that. Um, unfortunately, we're sharing them those two between the rooms. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're we need. Um, Matt, and Matt for 4, 5, 12, and obviously 14. So we're going to go to uh, number 6, Histo uh, Douglas Historical Society, letter of support for grant. 
Anybody here for that? Would you like to come up? Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Lisa Malzinski. Is that your partner in crime that you want to come up? Or? No. <laughs> She's sitting this one out. <laughs> Lisa Malzinski on behalf of the Douglas Historical Society tonight. You want to um, explain what this is, or you want me to just read this letter? This is a, a letter to the Massachusetts Historical Commission um, requesting that, um, or request, we're asking the board to support our request to the commission, application to the commission for a matching grant to do another phase of repair uh, in the barn. That is part of the Ian e. Jenks Store Museum down at the corner of the street, uh, Depot and Main Street. So this is just asking um, that the board yeah. support that application. This is a continuation of your restoration efforts that, no, that's correct. That you have done? Yep. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Mazinski? Oh, I love to see that uh, restoration progress. Great piece of history down make a motion that we uh, sign the letter of support for the Massachusetts Historic Commission's Round 30 grant application. Second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We go too fast. We're going to be sitting here by ourselves waiting for Matt to come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So the next item is number seven, Mass, Mass Department of uh, Fish and Game, letter of support for land purchase and possible votes. Is anybody here for that? Sue Perkins, 148 Wallen Lake Road. So probably it would make sense just to to read this. This is from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game. The Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game is considering the purchase of, uh, of the fee interest in land located in the town of Douglas. The letter is intended to serve as written notice of the uh, Department of Fish and Game's interest in acquiring this property. The property is under consideration contains 20 acres plus or minus of wildlife habitat. Enclosed in the is a locust map track number 2024-1-8. This depicts the property in which Douglas uh, Department of Fish and Game is interested. The current use of the property is predominantly open space in its natural condition. If acquired, um, Department of Fish and Game, working through its Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, will retain the property as open space, protect and manage the wildlife resources, and provide public access for passive outdoor recreation opportunities, including wildlife observation, hunting, and trapping. It is the owner's desire to sell the land as an addition to Douglas Fishing Game, uh, Douglas, keep saying it, Department of Fishing Game's Mine Brook Wildlife Management Area. Payment of the property taxes on Department of Fishing Game fee interest acquisitions for Douglas Department of uh, Fish and Game fee acquisitions completed from January 1st to June 30th. Once acquired, Department of Fish and Game will pay the remaining real estate taxes on the property for the fiscal year. The full real estate tax bill on the property the following fiscal year. Department of Fish and Game fee acquisition completed from July 1st to December 30th. Once acquired, Department of Fish and Game will pay the remaining real estate taxes on the property for the fiscal year. Well, there's a second page. I hope that the select board will consider the providing a letter of support to the Department of Fishing Games purchase of the property, a copy of which can be emailed to me, James G. McCarthy at, at mass.gov, with the original mail to Christy Edwards, Director of Capital Planning and Land Protection, Department of Fishing Game, 100 Cambridge Street, Suite 620, Boston, Massachusetts, 02. 
please do not hesitate to contact me by email with any questions that may have address provided above. You may reach me by cell phone, which I'm not going to read a cell phone number. <clears throat> I would be happy to discuss this project further if there should be of any interest. James McCarthy, uh, Department of Fishing Game Land Agent. <coughs> Do we have any questions on this? No, oh, just to reiterate, this is up near the Webster line on Route 16. It looks like a little landlocked piece. So it's okay. You got that off this map? No. <laughs> Anybody else have anything? I think it's a uh, good acquisition for the fishing game. An open space committee did. Uh, open space committee also gave us a letter, which I just came yep. across. Um, Dear Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Douglas Open Space Committee, please be advised that on February 27, 2024, meeting the committee voted to recommend that the Board of Selectmen fully support the efforts of the Commonwealth's Division of Fishing Game. Uh, to acquire Mr. Bick's property found on Douglas Assessor's Map Parcel 154-3. The committee wishes to convey how fortunate we are that this property is being preserved. We also want to share that there is an existing trail that goes through the property and we urge that you also ask that the uh, Department of Fish and Game protect the trail connection as detailed in an open space and recreation plan. Trails are critical to the town's outdoor recreation offerings and maintenance of the trails should be allowed to continue under their jurisdiction to keep the trail open and safe now and for the future. Sincerely, Susan Perkins, Chair Douglas Open Space Committee. So is there any reason to think that the trail that you mentioned in that letter um, does not already go through state? property I'm not sure it's it, it, it probably originates I think it's maybe originally the Bill and East trail right at the line okay. and it extends into that area yeah so it's contiguous they're not gonna not right. take care of that so right it's yeah, the people, the as people use it you know it yeah. gets maintained in a way right. The pretty extensive trail system up there that's maintained regularly by a different volunteers yeah. from different organizations. Yeah, so, I mean, we can put in there contingent upon the maintenance of the trail, but the reality is that we probably don't have that authority to make that um, caveat, um, but it's quite likely that that is exactly why they are If the trail is there, yeah, yeah, the people that you made it. So with that, um, seems like um, seems like a no-brainer to me. But I would make a motion that we endorse the Mass Department of Fish and Game uh, purchasing the parcel we had discussed tonight. Um, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, sir. Few acres. <laughs> More land. <laughs> So the next thing we have is authorize the town administrator to sign the uh, Simlac Mutual Aid Agreement, Central Mass Law Enforcement Council, for those who want to know what Simlac means. Lisa, this is a, a pretty standard agreement that we mm -hmm. sign on a regular yeah. basis. Chief told me that. All the area chiefs as well yep. are good with it, so um, yeah, it's not the first time it's been signed. Yep. Now we rely on mutual aid, so I'll make a motion that we authorize the town administrator to sign the Senlac Mutual Aid Agreement. I will second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, just a request to fellow board members, let's take some of the burden off of Tim so he's not 
stuck making all the uh, motions. <laughs> um, so the next thing we have um, is the grant acceptances, number nine. Um, if you don't object, Tim, I would like to uh, give one to each one of these two members so they can go through that process. So, uh, Ross, why don't you take the first one? Council on Aging? Yes. Um, yeah, I will make a motion to accept the, uh, the grant for the Council on Aging in the amount of uh, 15000 Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The uh, which is which is fine. Just for the record, um, when you when you do that, and sorry I didn't say it nope. to you. Um, <coughs> just uh, earmark grant award. Earmark grant. Just so we know, uh, for our minute taker over there on the other side of the table, she knows where it came from. That would all. Oh, that's Stephanie. Yes. Yep. Well, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the earmark grant award in the amount of twenty-five thousand for the highway department for designing and building costs for the new highway department. I'll second that. All right, good tricky. You skipped the page on us. Uh, no, I had some other one in here yeah, that I left a couple pages on that. <coughs> Motion's been made. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. 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 We're running out of things to drag up here. Um, so that brings us up to our uh, meeting minutes. There's a tag on this one. Is there any reason why there was a tag? I was tag? just separating. Oh, okay. Yep. So we have the January 2nd and the January 18th. We'll start with the 2nd. Give me a minute to read through it. through this. Um, Lisa, did you ever get that audio recording of that site walk from yeah. uh, December 23rd? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at some point we'll get those. No, you, those were. Did we do? Did, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. yeah. Head injury. A, I get it. <laughs> dramatic. dramatic. <clears throat> uh, I will make a motion to accept uh, January 2nd, uh, 2024 meeting minutes mm -hmm. as printed. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing as none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we got January 18th. Hopefully, Paul and Courtney know a little song or something they can help us out with the field. <laughs> 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 
needed for executive session? Excuse me? It's not needed for executive session? Yes, because that's for, that's the uh, post office property building. Just an update. Um, it's probably a discussion around the, uh, it's contract renewal time for that. Yeah, he was going to get in, the, get in the detail about that. We can talk about that if you want. Um, no, I, we don't have to. I just I'm gonna put a punch out where we can. No, I know that. So, so on number twelve, for uh, for a period of time, they were. Um, this is, I might as well say what it is. Discussion regarding uh, conservation commission meeting minutes. So, it's more of a general uh, talk at this point because they've. Uh, gotten caught up to where they were uh, considerably behind it in their meeting minutes for whatever reason. Um, they are up to date uh, as far as what has been um, given to them. Um, they're still back in September or October, is it, Matt? September. Um, but they're up to date on all their minutes? Uh, the board is up to date on accepting the minutes they've that, received. That they've received, yep. So uh, they have two new sets for review on Monday night. Okay. Who, who writes those? Do we have staff or is that a volunteer? Stephanie Goss. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Before we go too far, I'll make a motion to accept the January 18th minutes. Oh, I thought we already did that. No, we only did the right. <laughs> We did the first one, didn't we? Good thing the new guy's there. Yeah. yeah. Right. January 18th, <laughs> 2024, uh, as posted. You got any? All right, that's it. All right, so Ross has got a motion, and he's got a second on that. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, we're trying, trying to figure out how we're going to fill the slots. We didn't know we <laughs> skipped over something. <clears throat> so anyways, the, uh, the, um, that particular board is up to speed with it. The, um, it was quite the heavy load put on to the minute taker. They get caught up. Um, and she's rapidly getting caught up just um, another board that I'm on or a committee that I'm on capital uh, and she just sent me February 6th meeting minutes so the planning board and conservation um, as of late has been pretty drawn out so they're pretty extensive meetings for them for her to get caught up on so Lisa has uh, reached out to her to see if she needs any assistance on a temporary basis. Um, she feels that she's going to be able to handle it without a problem. So Lisa is monitoring that to make sure that we get up to speed. Jen does as well. Yeah. yeah. She does a lot of the. She's board of health, but FinCom, capital, capital. Audit, almost she's, everyone. She's got a. She's yeah. got a ton. So. <laughs> so with that, so. What Matt was going to talk about is what um, what we, we're supposed to do on open meeting law uh, requirements. Right? And I think the state is 90 days, but we have our local, which is I think is a little tighter, probably 30 days, 30 days on that, or the next available meeting, whichever happens first. Um, so and. The other issue that came up is some members of different boards think that these are supposed to be transcripts, word for word for word, and that's created quite the bottleneck and pressure on the minute taker. And that's not what the the intent is. It's supposed to be just an overview to tell you what what happened at the meeting, who showed up, and and what the what the topic was in a very brief. Uh, description of, of what went on and then if you choose that you want more information out of it then you watch that meeting. Um, a lot of times it works that way but for whatever reason um, I think direction is given and the minute taker gets overwhelmed. Um, she's some of the meetings it's taken her like six hours to go through these. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just it's just so much information on that. A lot of involved, I can imagine. Yeah, a lot going on. So what the town administrator is trying to do is is 
reel it back into where it's supposed to be, what the, what the regulation is, and uh, make it easier for the minute taker so she's not so overwhelmed with it. So I'm sure he may have something else, but that's a, that's a general outline of what his thought process was on it. His, when it first came about, it, a little frustration because he, he realized that he was so far behind on the on the conservation minutes, um, but they've rapidly caught up. Um, there's been a little bit of reorganizational change in there, and 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 with Matt and Benoit's efforts, they've getting it up to speed as the way they need it. I don't know if anybody has any questions on any of that stuff. Uh, I'm just trying to drag it out as far as I can, so then I can use up some time. Uh, <laughs> no, but that, that's the overall uh, view of, of what, it, what it was. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Lisa and Matt will have a conversation. If he chooses to add into it at a future meeting, he'll add into it. But uh, that's the general overview of what his thoughts were. No, be the. Um, I went over this with the town administrator, and um, it's important that he's involved in it. So I think it's a little more involved. This I think it has to do with special stabilization accounts and, and things like that. So um, I'm sure that Paul could answer the question, but we're going to both stay out of trouble. Agreed, Paul. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Is there any open session topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? Come on, Lisa, you can do something for me. <laughs> Tim and I would like to jump to 17, but we can't do that just yet. <laughs> so, number 11. I have a brief question, maybe. Yep, uh, go ahead. You'd fall into 15. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has the answer, but is there any update on the e chargers for the for the vehicles? I know. Oh, actually, yeah, I can help you with that. So if I talk really slow, I can touch that out. No, <clears throat> so it's before capital now. Um, the Matt reached out to the state. That was done under a grant program. We received fifty thousand dollars for a grant. It cost fifty six thousand dollars to install it. Um, the charger heads have been problematic from day one. Um, they actually never uh, got set up to be actually charging people for it. So they've been free since they've been put in, but they don't work. So you're really not giving away much. Um, and it became such a problem. That's why we. Um, at our last meeting, we amended the uh, town administrator's contract um, because we we're in default on part of our obligations. So, anyways, he's reached out to a couple different. He reached out to the state for us because we're required to maintain those and keep them up and working. If you just went ahead and did it on your own, then they could come back and say, "Well, give me back my fifty thousand." Right. So. You have to go through that process, but they've been such a problem all across the state, this particular brand, that the state recognized that and they authorized us to change it. So the uh, town administrator received two different quotes, one for 33000 and one for 36000 The $36,000 one is the uh, better known of the two that um, everybody seems to have a lot of confidence in it. And it's a pretty close um, cost of 33 or 36. So we, um, we actually uh, voted on that today. We're gonna put that on um, this, uh, probably under the special town, uh, special town meeting, right? We have that on the special? 
I believe so, because it's an, it's an ongoing, it's a repair, so we'll put it on the special, so that way they can fix it right away. If we put it on the regular one, they have to wait until after wait. July 1st, and then the, the quote comes in, it's higher and all that nonsense. So yeah. where he has a very current quote at 36, we put it through at 38. And that's a typical pra practice with the um, capital committee to, we'll ask the department when they come in, is it an actual quote that they have, or is it a um, an estimated cost, right? Um, estimated is a little dangerous because if you don't have enough in there, now you get, you're get stuck. You can't get the job done because there's not enough money to fund it, um, and um, it has to wait until the next meeting in order to get more money in it. <clears throat> so we're going to put that through at 38000 which will give them enough funds so then after it's after it's done and it's billed out and paid then it goes back uh but it goes back to jean says the project's been closed out and then she puts that in it's called the carry forward correct mm -hmm. i always get these things confused so that's why i'm looking at lisa for my yeah, support carry system to, forward right carry forward account so then when we get to the town meeting that's the first thing that she uses in all those closed out. So when we fund our capital projects, she'll use that funding source first before she goes to free cash just to close out those accounts. <coughs> Anything else you want to know about the charges? We uh, <laughs> call it AR. Uh, it's a good question. Oh, it's, uh, you know, I'm sure somebody wants to know that answer. We didn't put nothing in the uh, packet for the uh, monthly goals or nothing. No. I don't have any. Yeah. No, no. So what I'm looking for, what I, so you understand what I was looking for, it's just his, right? He had, he had the complete list that showed all the departments. Yes. <laughs> that's more. I I feel that that's more for his use for the department. I apologize. You asked for the town administrator piece. Just the town administrator piece. Um, because that that falls under us. It, it, right. It's kind of a little confusing because we, if we start reading into that, my concern is, is, oh well. So, so what's Tim doing today? He didn't do that. It was on my list. We're interfering with that daily operations, and that's a that's a no-go zone. So, um, I think for us, us, the best thing to have is just the town administrator's yeah. goals. Mm -hmm. I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but that's what my thought was on it. Any can we move comment? into the the 26th meeting then? Since I didn't include no, I want it on each each one, so oh, it's I just in front of it. Monthly, once a month. Well, once a month, that's fine. Okay. Yep. So why don't we just set it for the second meeting of yeah, each month, and saying. then just leave it at that? So then we know what to expect, and I'll forget next meeting and ask you the same question. <laughs> I won't forget. <laughs> as long as you don't put it on the list, I won't ask you. talk about the new highway it's on our list uh, on the grant thing so I, I guess it's I didn't anticipate talking about it 48 hours ago anyway so um, where we stand with that now is Weston and Samson hasn't um, met their design milestone that we had hoped that they would so it's gonna take a little bit more time for them to do that um, we need an accurate accurate guesstimate and a set of plans in order to move forward with it. We're in the process now. There's a uh, an appraisal done, being done on a piece of property that we have interest in, and we're waiting for that to come back. The hopes is it, it, it was going to come back for Springtown meeting, but I don't know. I've been a squeaky wheel about it, but I guess I'm not squeaking enough. I'll have to wipe the rest of the grease off and make it screech.
I guess I'll at least ex uh, acknowledge the, um, the support of the members of the board. Kevin's gesture was nice to um, say what he said when he left, but I felt that it was more important for us as a board to come together and make that decision versus somebody that's not here uh, making a decision and leaving. As I always do, I try to do the best I can uh, do what's in the best interest of the town. So anybody's got any concerns or comments or complaints about anything that I do, I would welcome it at any time. For you, Max, while you're... Um, Russ nominated you into that seat. Whatever you need for help to try to get you up to speed. I, I didn't think of it when I got up. I should have told you what, what you're going to do is you're going to open up the floor and ask questions to the other ones. Um, I realized when I got over there, I kind of set you up a little bit. You know, it wasn't intentional. It was just an oversight. Um, but as you move forward, any help that you need, reach out to uh, myself. Reach out to Tim. Tim. Tim is very experienced in this, and he has a wealth of knowledge as to how the process goes. Um, I'm sure that he would be happy to give you some guidance if you needed it. Anytime, Ross. Too. Um, can we talk about the request from the school? Do we need for that? Request for where's that one? Warren article. article on two hundred thousand. Oh, on, on number four? Yeah. No, Matt wanted to be here for that, and that's what Paul and I just dodged a bullet from somebody else. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ones? Okay, so what I didn't do... And we can just revisit it because the information is here under number 12. Your, your supporting documents actually in your your uh, packet, and that refers to Chapter 30A, um, commonly referred to as the Open Meeting Law. And the problem that, the challenge that, or problem, challenge, however we want to word it, that we'll face is if at any time somebody comes in and, uh, and approaches the town and they request such meeting minutes, we have 10 days to produce them. So that's why it's very important to put it up. If we don't meet the timeline, uh, we have to at least put our draft out there. I know I said that the first time around. I think that would be important if we didn't have a crack cable access operation. <laughs> yeah, under the 48-hour rule, it would be appropriate to give <laughs> props to the man behind the curtain. Really? Pat. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Which, as another capital item, um, Pat is seeking the support to get a new console for his uh, cable operation over there where that one's a little antiquated and uh, be, uh, way behind where he's having trouble trying to, he's actually challenged now with the immediate public access when not live. Um, it's been a problem for a little bit. The funds do not come out of free cash, it comes out of his cable account. And I think we're, we're live on the same channel, we always are, but Charter's putting the education channel on this channel now, so, but I just pushed it through on the regular one, so we're live. Nice. Yeah. Just in time to watch Dead Air. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show. Oh. So for everybody watching, that was uh, Pat 
in our cable department that has exposed us for uh, having run out of things to talk about while we wait for the town administrator to come back from the finance committee meeting. <coughs> could we play like elevated music or something? No, we could recess. Well, but, yep. Yep. Why don't we uh, take a short recess and we'll reconvene in what was it, 15 minutes? Well, say five minutes. Five minutes. And if we're not back in five, it may be 10. It's not 10, it might be 15. Right.
opening up. Um, okay, we're, we're back again from our little recess. So we going to, um, you're gonna talk about the BVT? Um, I'd like to see where you are. If do you have a, are you on the warrant? No, we didn't get there. So you you have a choice of warrant or BBT. Which one would you like? <laughs> <laughs> you have a you have a very excited audience in this room that would warrant. gladly accept any one or both. <laughs> so the BBT is on the warrant as a placeholder to be considered by the board, is my understanding. Um, Dr. Fitzpatrick presented to the Finance Committee. Um, you can go back to that tape. It was February 27th um, after the Douglas Public Schools. He presented three articles. One was his budget, the second was a, um, setting up a stabilization, and the third was a vote to um, put the roof and rooftop HVAC units. The way it was pre presented to the Finance Committee was, was within the debt, within the levy. Um, I did question him on that. He said it was up to the towns to make that individual decision about whether or not they wanted debt excluded, which is what I would recommend to the town of Douglas. We can't absorb their project within our levy on it because now you're, you're taking, it would be a fixed cost and you'd be taking away from other departments. Um, it does require two votes. It would require a town meeting as well as a ballot. Um, but I think that's important for a $10 million project. And the, <coughs> the timing of that is we're going to have to have a special election. Well, it would be, you know, it's, I don't know. Have you been notified from Dr. Fitzpatrick? I don't know where he I is. I haven't the, seen anything as of yet. Yeah, where he is in the process. He presented this to the Finance Committee with his presentation. Um, I don't know where he is with other communities or when they're going to vote on it. He was, and I don't, you know, I, I kind of agree with him as, as timing wise because we have some debt rolling off in 2025. He, he's looking to have it come out in 2026, 20, which is be what I do, right? You know, debt rolling off, you're going to backfill with the next project. Um, the problem I had, one is two things. One, you need to educate people as to why you need it. It's a $10 million project. You're you know, responsible to 13 communities. You don't just bring it to a finance committee and say, here you go. And the second, that he presented only the language to have it within the levy and not both. And, you know, I understand it's up to the town, but you, know, you present both things so that the town can make an informed decision. So those are the two issues that I have. Um, I don't know where he stands with the other communities. I don't know where they stand. Some communities have their town meetings earlier than we do. Um, so I would probably ask that the town administrator reach out to his colleagues and see where they are in the process and whether or not they're going to include it as part of this town meeting or wait until next town meeting. We say debt's rolling off. It's BBT debt. Yeah, so they did, um, their bond is rolling off in 2025. So there's thirty-four thousand dollars in this this budget coming up, and then that is done. So again, I don't criticize the fact that one's, you know, you, that's when you do you you time them. So when one leaves, it's kind of like that leveling it off. Um, and they are, you know, he he is very good at going after grants. So I'm sure he'll, you know, try to you know go to the school building authority. So I have no doubt that he's going to do that. Um, but again, it's it's. It's more in the manner in which it's presented. Um, and, I, and again, any project of that size, you want to make sure you're educating the taxpayer and who's going to be voting on the project. At what point do we need to vote on this? Does it have to be tonight, or is there more time to it? Because I'm going to let Lisa answer that question, um, because it is we put it on as a placeholder on this warrant. Yeah. It's strictly a placeholder. The board has not voted as to what articles are going to be included. Uh, I don't have the calendar with me, so I, I can't answer that question. You know, I know next week, we have two more big weeks. Next week is the, uh, again, you guys are meeting at the same time as the Finance Committee, Capital's presenting. Right. Um, we have Water Sewer and uh, probably Community Development at their meeting. And then April 9th is the public hearing. And that, that is it. Um, at that point, the, the Finance Committee is making their recommendations and we're going to the printer within that week. So. We're really up against that wall. 
No, wait and see what Lisa says, but it's probably the, the 26th is yeah, the last no, shot. Definitely no later than that. No, I know that. But. Yeah, I don't know what she has on the schedule for you. So then meet another meeting in March? No, we have one in March, the 26th. Oh, look at that. I don't know if it's a time change or whatever, but I've been all messed up. I kept losing a whole week. <laughs> leap year, <laughs> leap month. Yeah. No, it's a <laughs> time change. No, shouldn't we be meeting the 19th? No, no we, because of the election, we switched it <laughs> this month because the uh, primary was on the 5th. So we went second and fourth this week. Correct. This month. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Just so they weren't two weeks in a row. As long as we're still here after the solar eclipse happens. And the only reason I ask that is I think Matt has some other thoughts on that, maybe anything. So I just want to make sure right. that we hear right. everything that mm -hmm. will be he said that. so we don't just vote it. <laughs> yeah. And then it's too late. Yeah, it must have been a time change. It got me too. Yeah, I think it would be important to know where the other communities stand as well. Correct. Does <clears throat> anybody have any questions for Gene on that stuff? So specifically with this, is it they're just trying to get debt authorized by the 13 towns? So we have a yes or no, or is it basically they're doing the roof repairs no matter what? No, this well, they have to get it approved because they can't yeah. absorb $10 million within their operating budget, in my opinion. So their, again, their first recommendation, their su suggested language was that we have a special article no different than any of our special articles where you're just voting that one project and then we would pay the debt within our operating budget. Um, I, I did not agree with that manner. Um, I went to our financial advisor and I said, okay, I, I want language for debt exclusion because mm -hmm. I don't think we should be absorbing this. Um, you know, we're part of a group, so I guess if nine of the 13 towns approve it, um, we may be, you know, going back. Um, Basically but but again, them. it's it's really you know at the town administrative level and town manager level to see where those other communities are, and what their thoughts are. You know, I'm a resident of Uxbridge. Mm -hmm. I would want a debt excluded in Uxbridge for the same reasons here. Yeah. You know, because you're you're fighting for the same money, um, and it's a ten million dollar project. Yeah. You know, it should be debt excluded. And, and once you get to the <coughs> end, uh, near the end of the life of the roof, you're you're in limited time. It's not something you can say, oh, no, we're not going to do it because it, sooner or later it has to be, one way or another, it has to be fixed. Right. You, so, you have ownership to uh, the building. Correct. You know, you, you have yeah. to take care of your assets, you yeah. know, whether it's here it's or... It's an agreed upon partnership yeah. that we uh -huh. signed into. So. Um, so the question that I asked Jean uh, was on the BBT thing we have until the next meeting uh, before we vote on that because I would like to have some input from Matt on that. Yeah. The, technically, the warrant's not closing until your next meeting. Yep. Yeah, so just want to make sure that. Yep. Yep. I wasn't. I wasn't sure of the date, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah. Yes, March 25th. Are you going to tackle the annual and the special town meeting warrant stuff? I can tackle the special if I have a copy. Did you bring your? Oh, I didn't. Know I was coming I, over, so I don't have one. I am going to stress um, that this is still in draft mode and still fluid. We are meeting with departments, um, but this is where we are as of uh, 6 o'clock tonight. Ready, Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Jean. So Article 1, that is a typical housekeeping item that we have on almost every special now, both the November and the, the Maytown meetings. Um, we look at departments on where they are. As of this date, uh, we try to address all budgetary needs through the town meeting. And if there's anything outside of this, then we would go to the Finance Committee for Reserve Fund Transfer. But again, we, we like to get things in front of the voter. So these are the items that we've addressed. You'll see some with X's. Right now, I've identified them of having, um, needing some budgetary adjustment, but we're just, we're working through that with the departments at this time. 
So that is a standard housekeeping item. Article two, um, the town administrator has approved $75,000. I'm not gonna mention where we, right now we have not used it, but I'm not gonna speak any more about it. Don't wanna <laughs> cause the snow to stop falling. I need one more right. snow day. <laughs> what do I, no. I need a foot, I need 18 inches. I need, I need two days on the mountain, that's it. Just two. <laughs> two days on the mountain. Um, <laughs> if this is not needed, it would be passed over. Article three is the prior bills. Again, you know, this has been a little more challenging over the last two, three years because of COVID. Uh, we have find, I have found that more vendors are actually working remotely and it's just different. You know, we're, you know, we're, they're not, we're getting bills in later past our time frame. And if I was working for another company or, you know, I would, I would just pay the bill. What the town is, if we have not encumbered, if we have not set the money aside, if we did not know about it and it came in after, then we have to go to town meeting. So these are the bills we have identified um, as being a prior bill, um, which with a budget of 30 something million, I guess I shouldn't be upset, but um, we work really hard to not have this. And you know, you know, we work with the departments, but sometimes, you know, through circumstances beyond our control, they don't, they, if they date the invoice in July, they're not looking at the fact that service was in May but when it comes to me, I'm like, ah, you can't. It was last year. And it may, you know, so they didn't think it was a prior year bill, but because of the date of service was in the prior fiscal year, I cannot use this year funds to pay last year's bill. So there are a couple that we have to address. Article four, um, the state has allowed us to set a receipts reserve for appropriation up for opioid money for the settlement. Uh, last year, that money, the, the law didn't exist last year, so the money closed into free cash. This year, we're just taking it from free cash and putting it in the receipts reserve for appropriation until it's used. It cannot be used for anything other than that. Article five, I could actually let uh, Mike speak to it if he wants to. That's the um, items that we've addressed for some of the capital needs. These are for capital projects that were budgeted in either this fiscal year or last fiscal year that we just didn't have the funds available to complete the project after we went out to bid, but if Mike wants to. I'll speak with the first one. The first yeah, one no, is that's road fine. raised paving. That's um, because. I was just, I got hung up on the uh, highway dump truck. I was having flashbacks to our meeting earlier, but I, I think I have that number confused with a different piece of equipment. This is not in the format it's going to be in. These are just my notes. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's fine. So if you want to speak to this one, you can. <clears throat> so the, uh, the roadway paving repairs, because you don't have anything else with the notes, was that an add-on to the parking lot paving? No, that one is because um, Bob and Eric is using some of the Chapter 90 money. For so Northeast Main Street? Yeah, so okay. we're replacing mm -hmm. the general fund with the money that would have been coming out of Chapter 90. Yeah. So because he's using it for the project, we're giving Adam back the money in a different vehicle. Yep. So the EV charging stations, obviously, we already went over that. I explained um, how we get to that point. Uh, the post office parking, we had uh, appropriated $90,000, but we're about $50,000 short. So that'll bring up that total cost of 140. The highway department. Uh, dump truck with the plow. Um, we're removing the word international. Uh, moving forward with the through the capital process, there will no longer be any branding names on it. Um, because we put that name on there, um, Adam was restricted, or the highway superintendent was restricted to going after an international truck. He can't get them. A um, year and a half, I think, is what he was told uh, for a truck for lead time, if it comes in. Um, he did reach out to a uh, Mack truck, and he was told that um, they won't even sell them until they have them, and they're not coming in until the fall. So it's you better be ready for it um, and try to jump in the line. They won't take any reserves or anything. So he's got the challenge of trying to replace his equipment. Um, the school security system, what we're doing with that and capital, um, 
we switched some things around the if you recall we appropriate or encumbered as Matt corrected me the um, 200 and was it 25,000 or 75,000 from opera funds do you remember 225 I believe 225 from opera funds um, the project like every other thing that we've been looking at over the last year or so is greatly inflated uh, from where we thought it would be so to for the success of the project we're going to move the entire 140 that was um, in our capital plan for the replacement of okay. one of the oil Don't worry about it. it's good I'll get it. Oil tank. Well, I just didn't want it to open up, and it goes on your bare foot, and you're jumping around the room. Um, <laughs> so, to ensure the, uh, the, uh, the ability to complete the project for the school, um, we're going to increase, and so uh, a total increase of 365,000. Um, there also is a possibility that if for some reason something goes awry again, then it'll be uh, done in phases per campus. And that's all I have on number five for capital. Okay. Uh, the municipal center oil spill, uh, that is for the, the oil spill. We have previously approved 265000 We received an invoice here for 28000 today. And there's only 38000 in the account, and the project is not completed. I am waiting for a number from Adam is to fill in to see what we're going to need. So that's all in 500. Well, that's in addition to the yeah, the insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Great. For 330 gallons of oil. So that's the importance of why the school department needs to get those two tanks changed. So um, the, they've been challenged with trying to secure somebody to um, address the tank that they've already had the money appropriated for um, and because they're, they're running to a lot of resistance or cooperation in trying to get to the point where they need to be the school security system is extremely important and um, it was a combined agreement between uh, Courtney uh, Paul from the school and the capital committee to do that as well as the town administrator. And the last article um, was just presented to us today. Um, we are still late waiting for some language, but this has to um, be a supplement to the North Street project. North Street from Gilboa to Main Street or North Street the other way? No idea. Um, this is, well, let me just put it, this is after <laughs> the know. opera funds and the $100,000 was voted at the town meeting. That, and after the that was for a grant that I was getting, so they're probably, okay. So, it, Mr. Veneric. So I believe that's on the other side to answer my own question. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this was presented to us very late Last in the yeah. today, so that was the placeholder was really just added. And we lost them again. <laughs> he left his book, so that's a good <laughs> sign. <laughs> What's that? Do you want it? On the, on the annual? Because if we, if we get, he just has to do A lot the, of the articles haven't been discussed yet. Um, I can only speak, I, I can go quickly through the first six. And um, okay. I, item number 17, the school department is here to, if they wanted to, if you want to take them out of order. Okay. Yep, so why don't we do your first six? see if Matt comes back I would like him part of that uh, discussion so one two and three are really easy because that is your six page document um, the the budget and I with it was that presented this evening no. not yet um, that will be inserted here article three is the election anybody elected has to be put in its own chart so the town meeting votes on that separately but they are embedded in the budget in the in the six-page document item number four 
is the BBT assessment. That's the number we get straight from Dr. Fitzpatrick. Uh, you'll see in that 34,211 is their debt for this year for FY25. Um, again, that is scheduled to roll off for 26, which is why they're trying to put that other article in. Five, six, and seven, those are the transfer station, water sewer enterprise, and the cable receipts reserve. So those funds come outside of the operating budget. So the transfer station and water sewer are um, enterprise funds, so the money comes from users um, and rate users. And the cable, we actually receive money from charter, and that's the receipts reserve for appropriation account. So the money gets deposited into that account, and then we transfer out what we need to operate for the next fiscal year. Um, Article 8, that's reoccurring business, that's housekeeping. Um, you'll see that on every town meeting. Article 9 is the personal uh, compensation chart. So that's how, uh, once that chart gets inserted, that's how we determine how our employees are paid and what step and grade they are. Um, again, we're waiting for that. Article 10, capital still working. Um, they're scheduled to meet next Tuesday and the chair is scheduled to meet in front of the Finance Committee on March 26th at 6.30 if you'd like to attend. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there. Okay, so another, I was just reading through the uh, list and I noticed that we have um, three different, or at least two people, I don't know, maybe three, that could speak on the uh, number 12, which is the amendment to the general bylaw. Article 8, Wetlands Bylaw, Section 13, Citizens Petition. Um, is there anybody here that wants us to, could you come up, please? Again, Lisa Mozinski, 60 Oak Street. Um, I submitted this petition because through recent events dealing with Conservation Commission and wetlands uh, violations, we discovered that the town of Douglas's Conservation Commission can only um, uh, give a $200 fine per day or per incident to a violation a violator and the state allows up to three hundred dollars a day so this is language that basically brings the town um, up to speed on being able to find a developer or anyone actually in violation with wetlands so other than uh, increasing the um the monetary value of the fine from 200 to 300, is there any other changes within this bylaw? So if you see, I think you have it on the back side is the, the current bylaw language. Yeah. And so there is language that <clears throat> expresses um, more uh, parameters and in depth but this is also suggested from the um, Massachusetts Conservation Commission's um, language that they promote around the state. It basically updates it from 30 years ago <coughs> plus. Russ, did you say you've seen something in there about access to property? You asked me, for yeah, the sake of transparency, you called and asked me about this question mm -hmm. the other day, um, and I may have misguided them, so, because I've gotten some other information since then. Uh, so I'll just, like, scan through this real quick to see if it's the same exact thing I was reading, or... What I saw... What I saw, or what I interpreted, was that the, the conservation has uh, can come on the property at, at any time. And my question was, is this supposed to be any sort, for the landowner, is this supposed to be any sort of prior notice? Or is it as this project is, a project is going on, or if they see something, or, or are notified, do they have the right just to go on the property, or does the landowner need notification that we're coming 
type of thing. That was a question. I don't, I don't really see it in here at the moment, but. So I think it's common practice to try to give the landowner notification, but I'm not the conservation agent or. So, uh, so I did ask the conservation <coughs> agent um, because I had the opportunity to meet him on something else. And so I was there, I asked the question that Russ had asked me about and um, people's, you gotta be careful of the pe people's constitutional rights. So you don't have the right to just access the property. Um, they would have to be notified. Mm -hmm. um, because we would be in violation of the constitutional rights that kind of overrides a lot of things. So I don't know where that's in here. Actually, so, second did, so do you, second, par second paragraph. The Conservation Commission, its agents, officers, and employees shall have the authority to enter upon privately owned land for the purpose of performing their duties under this bylaw. But my question was, whether it's a construction project or, or a you know, private property, do they actually have the right to just come on the property? From what Without the conservation them. agent told me, he doesn't. Um, Matt, can you speak on this at all? I, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to. Okay, just, no, that's fine. A, um, a question to avoid any potential. Can you explore that before our next meeting? I should do that right now. Oh, okay. But it, it's also shall. So in some respects, it, it gives them the ability to do it if it's if it's if it's necessary. Right. I'm just looking at the wording. Yep. Like if, if there's if there's an ongoing issue, and say the landowner knows, okay, <clears throat> they can show up at any time. Then he, that's notification, whether it's taken a month or two months or two weeks or whatever, yep. he knows that, or they know that, that the possibility of them showing up is, is there. <clears throat> Lisa, are you the proponent for this bylaw? Yes. Did, so did you copy this from somewhere, or is this out of our town bylaw? No. The piece on the back is the current bylaw language. The piece on the back. Okay. So... I yeah. tried to follow you last ours time, is, so. Ours is, it's oh, on we're the at the bottom. bottom. Yeah, the, oh, current bylaw. Yeah. Okay. Current bylaw, right. And so then this is the bylaw that's basically suggested by the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. Okay. This is, this is their boilerplate to suggest yeah. what is current language, legal language for. So when, when Mr. Benoit comes back, what I would do is, is ask him to run this by land council to make sure that we're, we're compliant, so uh, we, don't, we don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the safest thing for us to do. I would hate to uh, vote on something that's in violation of anybody's rights. No, I'd appreciate that. Uh, do you mind repeating the question? Sorry. Okay, so Matt, so um, while you were gone, um, <coughs> this is cut and pasted out of the Massachusetts Right. Um, wetland bylaws. Right, the co and the Conservation Commission. And the record. Conservation Commission. On the bottom of the page has our current thing. Could you, um, I don't know if you have a copy of this and I can give you this, it doesn't matter, or at least we can get it to you. Run it by land council to make sure that we're compliant and we're not violating anybody's rights by this so we don't get the town meeting and it's challenged. It makes sense from my own personal standpoint, it makes sense to increase the value to the fine to three hundred dollars a day uh, in light of the issues that we've had with some of these larger developers um, it, it it's not gonna it doesn't really affect them uh, tremendously it, it's just something to to get their attention so um, we're regulated to be only at three hundred dollars um, one of the projects in town the neighboring town did three hundred dollars a day for ninety days so then they would have uh, $27,000 in an account to address their costs for administration and and um, peer review and things like that. So um, I'm assuming that's what your goal is, is to try to increase the uh, dollar amount so then we as a town, we're not bearing the costs on these projects. That's correct. And, and also our, um, our senator and representative are looking at the possibility of a more a graduated 
um, fine structure at the state level because all the towns are basically constricted by this very small amount of fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, does anybody else have questions for Lisa on this wetland bylaw proposal at the citizen's petition? So, um, Maybe just format. Um, this is a piece of legislation, and we're copying the current sign by uh, current sign by law. You had you had a flashback. I did. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if do we present this in strike through and underline the format? I have yeah, done that by council. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, it typically yeah, just so just so people know. Well, it. Either strike through or we'll remove the entire. There's usually some language in there, mm -hmm. so they know whether or not right. it fully replaces it or if it's integrated somehow. Yeah, that's just something to. So, mm -hmm. um, Matt, instead of you running it through Land Council, at least we'll just run it to our uh, to Rich, to Rich. Okay. and get clarification on the wording to make sure that uh, we're not violating anybody's rights in there, and then um, how it should be formatted. Assuming that our predecessors asked the same question, I don't think we will be because that portion appears to be unchanged. But good to check. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any more questions for Lisa? No? Ross? You good? Yeah, good. So just process wise then um, will you review this again or vote on it at the next meeting? Yeah, we're not going. We're going to wait and we'll go through it at our last meeting to vote on. I don't think we need to pull out individual stuff at, at this particular meeting. Okay. Um, I would rather have the uh, information from town council before we actually voted on this particular one. Right. Yep. Okay. So we, at the next meeting because we have to close the warrant. Yep. Yep. To March 26th meeting. 26th. Okay. Yep. It may it may fall under the where the end of that to subject to the constitutions and laws of the United States and the Commonwealth. It may be may fall under that, but I'd, I would like to know that. That's all. Sounds good. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Lisa. You're welcome. Okay, so before I screwed up my paperwork, what happened to the? back yet? He must have went back into the Finance Committee? I believe so, yes. <coughs> Reoccurring business, what is that? Number That's eight. Article 8. That's you a already, standard housekeeping. You already talked yeah. about that yeah. one. Number 10, the adoption of the revised fiscal year 25 through 29 capital improvement budget. You won't have that until the next meeting. Matt, oh, where did he go now? <laughs> Finally found something we had somebody to talk on. He's gone. He is. That's three. And school's here. In school. Like what? 17. No, nope, 17. I, I want Matt part of it. So that, oh, okay, then that's, I'll go over. that's for the uh, uh, an overall study of their building. If you see Matt Benoit, can you send them back? Yeah, 14, 15, and 16 are his. Right. And I believe there's others on Zoom. No, 13 says too. I'm sorry, yes. 
Um, well, 13 was you approved that to go back to the planning yeah, and on the board last meeting. Mm -hmm. But you can give us an update on it. Right? Okay. I'm trying Until to kill time now. If he's going to do something, he's got all kinds of stuff over there. Okay. Oh, he, he's got electronic devices, he's got everything going on. <laughs> Transfer a land ownership, Caswell Court. Who's that? <coughs> You got 13, 14, 15, 16, I think. Which one is number 13? Number 13 is the amend the uh, zoning bylaw section 6.8 solar bylaw. Just give us an update as the way you stand. We've talked about that at a previous meeting. Yeah, the planning board is holding a public hearing tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. At that point, they'll make a recommendation to this to this board. So we'll have that back on the 26th. Yes. Okay. Next one is transfer of land ownership map. Parcel 118-2, Caswell Court. All right. So with your permission, I'd like to share my screen. For the minute taker, that voice that we'll hear in the background is Matt Benoit, Community Development Director. Thanks for putting that in. I forgot all about it. <laughs> but the, um, the Open Space Committee has recommended the transfer of ownership of map and parcel 118-2 from the Town of Douglas to the Douglas Conservation Commission. This is a parcel. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. This this is a parcel that is um, that has been identified in our 1998 master plan as a parcel looking to be preserved under conservation. And the town uh, recently took ownership of it <clears throat> through tax title, and that period has lapsed for the appeal. So we have the ability to transfer this to the to the Conservation Commission uh, by town meeting vote. <clears throat> Happy to answer any questions. This is the parcel here. Um, one of the it is a landlocked parcel, but it is possible that through the future application of a Caswell Court potential subdivision that we might be able to gain access to this parcel. Um, there's a pending application with Conservation Commission for ANRAD flagging that we don't know what the application is going to be yet, if it's going to be housing or anything, we're not sure, but it could be a condition to add access to this lot for, for recreational use in the future. So I think this would be a great opportunity for the select board to transfer this to conservation. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Uh, Benoit? Just roughly, what's the size of the parcel? The parcel is... It's 47.29 47 acres. You good with that? Oh, yeah, it is. Yep, I'm fine with that. Do you have any questions for him? Nobody has any questions on that. I'm assuming that we're going to vote on all these things come the 26th meeting. Uh, it's just an overview of what we have on our mm -hmm. list. Uh, number 15, revised stormwater management bylaw and regulations. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt Benoit, Director of Community Development, again. Um, we have a draft stormwater management regulation general bylaw before you this evening. This is a general bylaw, and I also have Nick Christoffery from CEI, who is on the Zoom, who is able to answer any questions you may have about the stormwater bylaw. This is a MS4 
uh, regulated permit process in which we're supposed to be updating our general bylaws to add a stormwater management bylaw. And what you have in your packet, I believe, are two items. There's the stormwater management rules and regulations uh, for the Conservation Commission. That's for them to adopt after town meeting were to adopt the Article 12 proposal to the stormwater bylaw. Um, Nick Christopheri um, is on Zoom, and uh, Nick, if, if, if you could introduce the process to the select board, I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm Nick, Nick Christopheri with Comprehensive Environmental CEI. I've been working with the town now for about five years or so on, on various stormwater-related issues. So, uh, so without getting into too much detail, because I know you've you got a pretty full agenda already, so the way this typically works is communities, in order to meet these, these mandatory requirements from EPA, will adopt a, an ordinance or a bylaw via town meeting. And the idea with the ordinance and the bylaw is that it is fairly basic and straightforward. Um, it has things like enforcement and definitions. And a paragraph that allows for adoption of accompanying regulations. And the idea is that once the ordinance is adopted at the town level, that piece is essentially done. And then sort of all the details and all of the other components are contained in the regulations. And the way the regulations typically are done is they can be adopted by a planning board or a similar board at a routine monthly meeting. So the idea is that if there are any changes or updates that need to get made, it's a lot easier to go with this process in that you just then have to go formally notif notice that you're going to be a, a looking at these regulations during a meeting, and then you can make changes as needed at a typical planning board meeting. Um, and what I mean by that is, is this is why we're looking at having two documents rather than just a single bylaw. So, um, so that being said, I'd like to hear any questions because uh, I, I think there may be some history on this with the town previously. What do you mean history on this? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, there was um, there was an attempt to get a stormwater bylaw passed by this board. I believe it was 2018, uh, and it did not pass. It did not get to town meeting floor because the board of selectmen did not vote to support it. Was there anything in the notes as to why? I did not check the minutes. Yeah. yeah. Do you recall Matt, any of that? I, Matt, I thought this had gone way, way before, like 10 years ago. I thought this went before the voters. Yeah. Yeah, in 2010, there was a fairly uh, aggressive stormwater plan. I don't know if this doesn't appear to be that, uh, but the townspeople rejected that based on the reach that the town was looking to um, codify. I believe the general bylaw hit this board in 2016. I think that was the year I was looking on. And it has since been reworked to make the Conservation Commission the permit granting authority. Is this something unique to this town, this particular bylaw, the wording, or is this something that you're using in other towns? No, this is pretty standard at this point. Um, I mean, a lot of these requirements actually have been around since the, the permit was previously released back in 2003. So there was actually a, a requirement to have a bylaw and an ordinance and regulations in place back in 2008. And then since then, an updated version of the permit has come out, so now there's, there's sort of new requirements. Um, so the town currently doesn't have any requirements in place, so what we're looking at doing is getting the town up to where it should be to meet these EPA requirements. And um, we, we have been seeing, uh, so this is a mandatory requirement, like I said, it's, it's been required to be in place for some time now. And I have, within the last six months or so, seen EPA reaching out to communities that don't have these regulations in place and they're starting to ask them about it, and in some cases, they're actually starting to hand out consent orders to communities that don't have these regulations in place. So, um, you know, I just I just want to let the board know that we are seeing this. This is on EPA's radar. Have you been involved in the presentation at, at any other towns with this? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've done many of these meetings before, and 
and this, this is like this is the very very high level presentation and, and I've done all the way down to working sessions within communities and public outreach I public outreach and education presentations and, and so on and so forth is there any general concerns that usually pop out of the audience when uh, you present this well every community is is different I get that uh, I will yeah. say I will say that probably 80 to 90 percent of my communities there is no pushback at all in general it's 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 protecting the environment um, obviously there's the other side of the coin too that there is an additional cost to de there, this will have an additional cost on some development um, so as, re as, a, as a result of this bylaw essentially any project that is disturbing an acre or more will have to meet certain requirements and that they will have to treat stormwater and do erosion and sediment controls during during construction. <coughs> so just the, the, the important thing to know is only if you are disturbing an acre. So it doesn't matter if your parcel is an acre or more and you're just putting in a deck or a swimming pool. It's only if you're disturbing an acre. So these are going to be subdivisions and these are going to be larger commercial developments and so on and so forth. <coughs> so that's kind of the flip side of the problem. Well, in this town, we also have uh, village residential, which is only a 20,000 square foot lot. And uh, we have some other sections of the town that you would be under an acre of land that have been problematic for stormwater runoff um, on the west side of town. So this, those wouldn't be included in this bylaw? How, did it, how do we capture those? Well, um, those would not be included in this bylaw. The way we've, we've worded it is EPA only only mandates you regulate development of an acre or more. So some communities, not too many, have opted to regulate smaller developments. But you know, just keep in mind you're then going to be pulling in more development and more 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 projects than you otherwise would be. Um, some communities have opted instead to go with like a tiered approach. So you kind of have EPA's one acre threshold where you have to do all these different requirements. And then maybe you have another smaller threshold, like say 15,000 square feet or 20,000 square feet, that would trigger stormwater mandates and stormwater control requirements, but not necessarily to the same level as regulated by EPA. And um, I guess I would. I guess what my suggestion would be is let's get this one acre threshold in place, and then we could look at regulating those smaller ones. I just I'd like to get this one acre thing in place that way you're covered in case EPA starts asking. No, I get that, and I'm not trying to complicate it. Um, only because I'm on another land use board, so I'm exposed to it. Is what makes me think about it. So we have a section of town that has five and ten thousand square foot lots. Um, being so close, it's it's challenging to try to manage your your water on site, um, but it has to be done because uh, the administration office sometimes during the rainstorms their phone may ring frequently. <laughs> so it's been your experience to try to pass through this larger one first and then try to tighten it up afterwards. Most communities, honestly, they don't want to even bother with the smaller ones. Um, I only have probably two communities I can think of out of, say, 20 that are looking at regulating smaller smaller developments. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be unique to the town of Douglas. Um, I'm not trying to be rude, but the other communities aren't having the problems that we're having. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we're thinking about that, that's all. <coughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly something we could think of. I mean, what we, I've really just been going at it from that from the EPA with that one acre threshold. Um, Matt and I could talk a little bit more about, you know, does it trigger like do those smaller ones? What did like what what would those smaller development projects trigger now? Like, would they trigger site site plan review or no site plan review? These are residential uh, parcels, single family homes. Some of them, the home, current home on it, probably 24 by 32 in, in size. Uh, we have had applicants that come through, get permission to go all the way up to 10 feet to their property lines. That's a problem, right? So um, 
Matt's familiar with what I'm talking about. Uh, they get into detail what the section of town is. Um, it's something that you may want to consider looking into for this bylaw to see if it's something that you could potentially put in um, in there. If you can't, you can't, but I would like to at least think about it. Sure. Yeah, Matt, you and I can talk after. <coughs> No rush. You got until next week. No, two weeks. Thank. <laughs> plenty of time. Yeah, plenty of time. Does anybody else have any questions for this guy? No questions, no. Mr. Chairman. Just a comment. Oh. No, no question. Um, we've had any number of incidents in town involving stormwater, <laughs> running off onto other people's property, running down the street, and we don't have. A vehicle to address that in many cases so we try to cobble together a response based on concom's jurisdiction over protected wetland resources the zoning codes environmental standards which are rather loosely written but they're they're based on nuisance doctrine and whether or not the things that come off your property cause someone to lose the quiet enjoyment of theirs or damage it and uh, the highway commissioner's authority to prevent people from dumping water on the roads of the street, uh, on the roads of the town, sorry. Those are very vague guideposts towards trying to get to a solution for what are you going to build and to what standard and what is actually going to be allowed. The core of this bylaw is a policy statement that you will cause no net change in the amount of water that comes off your property. So it doesn't mean that you stop all the water from coming off, it's that you make no net change. And where it was going before, it still needs to go, and if it, the rest needs to stay, you can't increase the volume of stormwater that runs off your project if it's greater than an acre. It would close this area of uncertainty for our regulatory authorities in town, which largely have shared responsibilities Think of a Venn diagram where the, the circles overlap only when they want to. They kind of move away from each other from, based upon the facts of every given situation. This would resolve that and place CONCOM on firm footing. There are those, I would put myself in this camp, that say the wetlands law already has significant authority for conservation commissions to act stormwater issues that don't involve protected resources. But getting people from here to there is harder to do based on what everyone else is doing versus having your own bylaw, your own general bylaw. So uh, this is a timely discussion mm -hmm. to have based on what we've been up against. You know, the lion's share of the calls we fielded in town hall in the last six to eight months have had to do with stormwater. Yeah. So. I'm not looking to delay that process because we, we have a very limited amount of time, but at the same time I want to make sure that they, at least um, this consultant is aware of what our challenges are in town. So in general, um, you don't normally have the, um, the neighborhoods like we have that, that I'm discussing, mm -hmm. um, but we definitely need to do something with it. I fully agree with you on that. It might might actually already be there. We're green communities participant and with that my understanding is we were forced to adopt the stretch code and doesn't the stretch code tap into Well we already have the stretch too? code. I don't know if it does. So town meeting adopted the stretch code. Yeah. yeah. There is the super yeah, no, fragilistic expialidocious stretch code that yeah. we're, we haven't put up for a vote yet. Um, but that stretch code does tap into stormwater on these smaller lots that Mike was mentioning. I want to defer to a builder who would. I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I have no idea. I, I think a good plan of action is at least um, these two have a, a conversation about it, um, not to hold up the process because we don't have any time left to be playing around with this thing and we've had a large amount of issues uh, with the larger developments in town. So um, who's, uh, 
Matt, uh, you and I had a uh, conversation about the enforcement authority on this. Uh, would that still be the building commissioner? No, I think Mr. Benoit pointed out this anticipates that the permit granting authority would be the conservation commission. And their reviewing agent could be assigned by the commission and likely would be the conservation agent. Yeah, and the only concern I have with that is with any appointed boards on any given day, they could change, right? So you want you want to have uh, consistency through the process. So um, the conservation agent or some other staff member would probably be appropriate for enforcement. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. I don't know if anybody else has anything to ask on this. We went from trying to fill our time slots to try to end them now. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's all right. Mm -hmm. Paul, I tried to get Paul to sing two or three times. He wouldn't do it. So I hear he whistles. Yeah. Nope. Next time. Yeah, let me go back and at least look at the, the, the bylaw one last time before it gets finalized for town meeting and see if there's a, a provision I can put in there somehow to allow for those smaller developments. I just, I just got to think how to do it. Because most of the meat and potatoes is contained within the regulation, so it would at this point really it would just be making sure that we set up the bylaw to allow for those smaller development regulations, um, so we don't have to do this again. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, that 2010 town meeting was not pretty. Mm -hmm. Townspeople didn't take a, a whole lot of liking to an overreach of storm water, so find the balance there. And good luck. That is that is what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if nobody else has anything on the stormwater, um, the next thing we have is the uh, Sutton Douglas. We're going to just finish up with uh, Mr. Benoit, so that way he can. Uh, well, thank you for your time. I'm going to jump. Yeah, up. thank you a lot. Thank you. The Sutton Douglas Development LLC subdivision. You have anything on that, Matt? Yes. So I believe in your packet um, you may have a copy of the planning board decision. And if not, there's a condition of their decision for the Southern Douglas subdivision that they needed to transfer the open space uh, to the town prior to uh, prior to start construction. So I have Tim Flynn, who is on Zoom, who is also the applicant. I would like to introduce himself and kind of the idea behind this. Article. Thank you, Matt. Uh, members of the board, thanks for, uh, thanks for your time. I know it's uh, nine, so I'll try and make this as quick as possible. Um, so the, the, the idea behind uh, uh, this development was to, uh, you know, try and uh, make right what we found out through the process of uh, acquiring the land and, and uh, going through the, the zoning process and getting this approved was that, uh, you know, some time back there was a, uh, you know, th there was some land that was supposed to be deeded back to the, to the town that didn't occur. Uh, this land is buildable, um, but as a, you know, as an ongoing commitment, as, uh, to further our relationship in town and, uh, you know, to uh, appease and, and really try to put a lot of the uh, butters' uh, concerns uh, at ease. Uh, we are looking to, uh, you know, deed this land over. I believe it's, uh, Matt, apologies, I don't have it in front of me. It's about 54 acres. Uh, uh, back to the, uh, back to what I, I believe the Conservation Commission for to be overseen as uh, open space. Does anybody have any questions for this gentleman? Anything else to add to Matt? So, Mr. Chairman, the draft deed is under review by town council. They gave us an opinion. Uh, a fraction of their full opinion on the on the deed so far, but it's to be modified uh, in the future. But it should be ready for our next meeting. Anybody else have anything on this? I also pulled the plan up on the screen. 
Yeah. It's already been, uh, the lot layout has already been recorded and the plan has, has the parcel outlined in our, in our ArcGIS maps. Yeah. And that is the property. It has an outlet onto Mumford and outlet onto Conservation Drive. Just getting it. Open space. That's kind of. Nobody has anything else on this? set them. I guess that's it for now. Matt? Reminders. Thank you, everyone. Yep, thank, thank you. you. So a couple things so we can um, help the school department leave. Um, you want to do the uh, district-wide facility study for us, Paul and Courtney? Good evening. Good evening. You're still awake? We all are, I think, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I know you have in front of you our proposal for a warrant article to do a facilities audit of all of our buildings, the four buildings and the public schools. Um, I could go through a rundown or I could just answer. I mean, we all know that the primary is 45 years old, the high school is 20 years old, the elementary in the middle are 10. I could answer questions, do a presentation. I know it's 9, 10 and you still have about a few more articles to go. So yep. whatever works for you. Um, So what's your overall goal? You don't have to go through all the. Oh, <laughs> so what's your, your goal in, in trying to put this study? I guess that's the easiest way to go about it. Sure. So again, if you look at our capital requests over the past five, six, seven years, it's all around maintenance, mm -hmm. repairs. Right. Um, we've done a great job going through and, analyze, and analyzing things. We'd love to have an a comprehensive report that will provide documentation of all of our facilities and everything to be able to assist the town and us in creating a five or ten year plan as to how we can make sure that our buildings continue to be maintained the way they should be maintained. Um, well basically so that we can, particularly with the primary school being 45 years old mm -hmm. I mean things are starting to to, you know, everything is getting very old. Um, the only thing we've done at the uh, primary school during that time, a roof work was done on the cafeteria in the hallway to the gym in 2003, in the section where the child care is located. That was replaced in 2017, approximately 6,000 square feet. And a preschool bathroom was done in 2012. But other than that, the entire building is, is, is very, very old. Um, the high school is over 20 years old. Um, as you know, we had that rooftop unit that includes the two compressors and evaporator coil. Um, that needed to replace, be replaced this past summer. And just last week, um, the, oh, I'm so tired, I can't even think. Um, freezer. The condensing unit for the school lunch freezer mm -hmm. went. So we immediately had to get a rental. We had to move all the food out so it wouldn't go bad. And we are having that replaced on Saturday. Um, the cost for that is um, $12,480, but that's just one little unit. Um, so district-wide, we have 400, 461 HVACR separate equipment units. A number of those are, are at the high school. Um, and a number of the components of our buildings, the major components that we just want to, in order to make a good decision with regard to knowing what, where, what the condition is in each of the buildings, to be able to know where they're at, and also for the purpose of prioritizing. Um, and I think you know it's a good idea for the not only for the, the town side but for the school side as well, as far as from, from a prioritization of the projects, possible full-on renovation, particularly for the um, primary right. school, and then um, determining the financing and the possibility of MSBA as well. We can also look into that. They did resurrect, as I mentioned, at the capital planning their accelerated repair program. So we would obviously look at that at the same time once we get that report. Um, so that's basically where we were coming from. 
Anybody, I have a, uh, a couple comments, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. Does anybody have any questions on this before I ask anything? Uh, the only thought I had was, um, where are we with the joint staff member to be the facilities person? We had talked about and, and that's, and that's what I was going to lead into. So, so, lead it to um, so it, it may be, uh, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to approach the subject. So the timing may be, um, it may work, right? So you're in a position where you, um, you need to get a handle on what your equipment is in, in your buildings and things like that. Uh, we're in the process of a transitioning point where the staff's moving around uh, and it potentially could open up a possibility for a position. Um, if we use it town-wide, if you, um, you could just study 200,000. I think we just yeah, we said up to two hundred. Yeah, right. because so it depends on how it, it just it. guesstimated number. Yeah. So it's a, I'll forget all about it in a couple minutes, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, so you figure a couple hundred thousand dollars. So if you're going to hire a uh, qualified facilities guy, I'm going to I'm going to guess that he's going to be somewhere equivalent to what a building commissioner would would make um, at the high end of things, right? So you get somebody in that's on staff that may be able to help um, get a handle on it versus having a company come in and they just give you this whole bunch of paper and if you're not having a an active plan that you can just work on and address it and get it done that report's going to be like the uh, 1998 master plan that they're trying to rewrite now that nobody ever looked at after um, it's just something to consider. This is a conversation uh, between um, the school department and the town administrator to see if you can come to a point where there's a possibility there to, to try to uh, combine forces that we could address the issues, right? I mean, we have issues on within the town buildings here. I'm a little more privy to it than um, my other members here because I'm on the capital process, so I get to see what everybody needs and wants and, and, and everything else. Um, it might be helpful for you guys to do it. Um, Matt and I have had different conversations as to how that particular person could be utilized, and he has his thoughts and I have my thoughts, and not necessarily um, trying to tell each other what to do. We're just bouncing ideas off. So. The, to do things, um, something to consider, to think about. I'm not saying to stop what you're, you're doing with, with your thought process on as far as getting a study done, but it's something that you may want to consider. It might be more helpful for you too, just to get more continuity going through the capital process, uh -huh. getting your vendors, it's like <laughs> you've, uh, during the capital process you um, express the trouble that you have in trying to get people to be responsive as far as vendors and subcontractors and things like that. Once you have somebody that actually does this for a, a regular living, they'll gonna be they'll have contacts in which they can get you numbers that may help you. Because that's the challenge I have in capital, right? You you come and it's like I need this, but I'm really not a hundred percent sure what it is and then well, how do I put it on the capital budget, right? So uh, the two of us are going back and forth with it. So just a thought. That's all it is. Yeah, not, nothing more, to nothing less. Conversation, the dialogue mm -hmm. with Mr. Orjek. I, I think it may be helpful for you, for everybody involved. Um, I think it's a, it's a conversation between your end of the table with you and, <laughs> and Matt than, than in the board here. Because yep. uh, you guys know the daily operations, what you're faced with. I get a very small snapshot on capital and and even smaller picture at this table. So, just a thought. Absolutely. And it, as you can tell, uh, Tim started right off with it, and then um, Ross echoed it. So okay. it's something that's on everybody's mind. We haven't even discussed it, but it's mm -hmm. it's just a little chatter here and there that it's there. So, oh, yeah. if it's something that works, yeah. great. It's yeah. great for everybody. So we'll do that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do want to thank Courtney for her little spreadsheet that she sent over that's going to help me on capital. Um, <laughs> that, that will work well because it simplifies the process so then um, we get them, if we get them, but if we get them each January, it'll make the capital process much easier. So are you saying that the timing of everything with this Warren article potentially going on 
the annual town meeting and maybe some conversations we could have the stars are all aligning it may it, okay it, it's something that you you guys need to yeah. talk because um i don't think we have enough uh, information to be able to tell you that right this is something that i think the administration of okay. both both sides of the or oh, that end of the table um, need to just come together and just compare notes and see if you can make it work. I think so. What I'm getting out of what these guys are saying that you would have support, okay. right? So and that's huge, right? So if you're getting support, you're not like you two come up with a, a brainstorm and then you got to come see us and try to sell it to us and we're not even on that page. It's very difficult, but <clears throat> it might help you. So sure. that's all. Yeah. Just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Always open to talking. Anything else? I don't have anything else on that. Any of you guys? Um, just school specific, I guess. Uh, curious, is the high school at capacity? No. No. And is the one under that, we'll call it the, my kids. The old middle school, the, the, old, the old high school, the, the new middle school? school. <laughs> Are they at capacity? Um, we still have a little bit of space. Yeah. A little bit of space there. Class size and some of the grade levels are big, but as far as empty rooms, we still have we still have a little bit of room to add if we needed to. So the reason why I say that, and I know we're constantly looking at the BBT enrollment and what that has happened. And I remember speaking with a teacher maybe six months ago. Um, said that, uh, and this is someone that's in the building like you guys are, you know, constantly. Um, he identified the eighth grade class being disconnected from the high school as a reason which it's much easier to cut ties with the Douglas school community. So has the school committee or have you guys ever looked at bringing the eighth grade into the high school? Quinn, I, well, you talk about that. Well, it used to be part yeah. of the high school and part of the whole selling, if you'll remember, because you were around um, at the time, was, you know, as far as building the elementary school and also the intermediate school was bringing the eighth grade down. That was a whole, one of the biggest Big things. I want to say biggest. Big things about selling the whole school project at the time. Yeah, and I think yeah. it worked in the opposite direction. <laughs> right? You got a school, but there's there's no tie in the eighth grade to. The oh no, but I'm just saying what you know when they did propose the project. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, would you guys consider that again? Um, I think we one thing we would have to look at would be the uh, would be the funding mechanism with when we received reimbursement from the MS was it through the MSBA. Yeah. It was done. Yeah. How was it sold? So we'd have to go back and look at look at that. See if it's tied that was all, that was tied right into yeah. the whole project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we have talked about it. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's get back on what we're doing. So under here we have um, two different things, Matt. And so you just help me to see if it's the same thing. Um, 18 and 19. 18 is BBT roof reconstruction replacement and rooftop HVAC, and then BBT creation of stabilization account. And then we have on our regular agenda, um, BBT proposed warrant thank articles. You. Uh, any of these, thank you. Any of these um, the same, or are they all three different things? They are the same. Okay. Um, yep. But here it's shown as a placeholder on the warrant. And I think there's a threshold question of whether or not this board even wants to put these articles on the warrant. Mm -hmm. I think that's your prerogative. And um, I'll check that with town council and make sure that you don't have any requirements anywhere to put things on your warrant. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I don't think you do if you haven't received notice required by the agreement that formed the BVT catchment area and, and school funding mechanism. So I would encourage members of this board to review Dr. Fitzpatrick's presentation, the FinCom, on the video from February 27th. From you know, the beginning to the end of his presentation is about half an hour. And vet for yourselves you know, what you think is going on here with these two specific things. There's concern amongst the town managers and administrators that I speak with, and I think we're five or six strong um, on a regular basis, 
over the way this is being structured and whether or not um, we have a clear indication whether this debt should be operationalized and put on our operational budget or whether we want to take it to the ballot box as a debt exclusion under Prop 2 and a half. The overwhelming consensus amongst us is that we recommend to our communities that you put it on the ballot as a debt exclusion and let the taxpayers decide whether they want to pick up this debt. Um, then that kicks off a process. So if town meeting approved this warrant article, you would then have to have an election or put this item on an already scheduled election before September 15th. So it makes things really tight. Because here we are on March 12th, town meeting's May 6th. So you're setting off a series of timeline decisions if you agree that you want it to be excluded debt. Um, there's been some difficulty pinning down what the project exactly is. It's $10 million, it's being marketed as a roof. And yet if you listen to the doctor's presentation, he says at one point, the majority of the spending would actually be for rooftop HVAC units, and the roof itself is coming in more like 4.4 million, which sounds a little bit more plausible to me, because it's X times mm -hmm. the number, it's the exact same material that we're putting on our roof here at the Municipal Center, so it's, you get a little bit of a per square foot cost, and you can, even assuming economies of scale and other things, it's still right about right at 4.4, so we need 10 for. The other item here is the stabilization account. We have recent experience doing this, right? If you have a special purpose stabilization account, it is usually restricted to a, the specific purpose for which it is set up. And once that project or funding need is addressed, you have the other question, what happens to the remainder? Does it become part of a rolling capital budget, a source of funding? for BVT into the future or should it be returned because once we fund the projects we say we wanted them to do, shouldn't we get our proceeds, some of our proceeds back or offset our debt payments or some such arrangement. There is none of that detail provided to the municipalities presently. So the effort that is on ongoing right now is to get BVT to actually disclose more details about what their plans exactly are and what it is they're asking for, so we, we know what we're asking the taxpayer to do. Um, so this is a little bit controversial, these two provisions. And that uh, stabilization account, is that, do they already have one? They is have a, a, is a, this a special stabilization account that's going to be a mark similar to what we do with the uh, I can't say I know the answer to that question. When they close their budget every year, it's called uh, something terrible. I think it's called errors and deficiencies or excess, excess and deficiencies. But I, I like errors. Um, <laughs> excess and deficiencies. It's like free cash. Right? Uh, that's like saying found money. Errors and deficiencies. It's like yeah, I, I, yeah. errors and free and that's found when I, money. When I go home go. and I look at the note on the refrigerator, that's errors and deficiencies. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Anywho, um, so, the reason so he why has the that so-called almost free cash account. Mm -hmm. I can't say, because I've never looked at his finances that closely, whether they have other special purpose stabilization accounts or not. Um, what I would be concerned with, just, just as we set up our own special stabilization account, um, how does the money come out and by whom, right? So is it by the, uh, the consensus of 13 towns or is it by the consensus of the school committee or whatever or whatever the case may be and is it it's like we we set up our special stabilization account even though we um, labeled it if the if it uh, the situation arose and we had um, two-thirds vote we could take that money out and use it for something other than what we originally intended it for mm -hmm. Um, which is not what I want to do, um, but I would like to know that if they have the same kind of guidelines in there. Right? It sounds great to, in the label stabilization account, but it's all on how you manage that money. Right? Now, I don't worry about it so much in this town. Uh, we're pretty uh, 
strict on what we do. It's not just uh, loose. So our goal right now is to try to draft language for you um, for both the warrant article and any motion to be made at town meeting mm -hmm. if you decide to put it on the warrant that would reflect the fiscal controls and concerns that we have. And, uh, I know one community has already vetted their language. I think Upton has with their town council, but I want a chance to run it by Rich Bowen before I make mm -hmm. any recommendation to you. Anybody else have any questions on that? So if we do nothing and the 12 other communities do something, we're along for the ride anyway. We have to. At that point, it's either got to come out of operating or we're going to go through a debt exclusion. Well, ac the actually, they only need um, eight. Or is it eight or nine? Nine other communities. They don't need 12. They only need nine. Two thirds. Right. right. So if they get nine communities, it goes. It doesn't matter what you want to do. But, Mr. Chairman, I think there's more to it. I, it's a good question. If the town were not to put it, if Douglas were not to put it on your warrant, but everyone else did, and it passed. So here's what's weird. I don't know the answer. If everybody's language is just a little bit different, how does it get reconciled? Right? Yeah. And I also don't know if we did, if the town of Douglas did nothing and it passed everywhere else, a nut, there was critical mass around a specific language that nine passed it. It would still, I think, get kicked back to Douglas to determine whether you were going to do it as excluded debt or operational debt. I think you'd have another bite at that apple. Yeah. Because I don't think anybody can tell you what to do. They're going to tell you that they want the money. <coughs> but they're still going to leave it up to you on how you do it, whether it's on the budget or off. <clears throat> this is uncharted war. I don't think anybody's been here before on this. Um, I know we just went through this in Westport with Diamond, but they're building a whole new school, right? So it went to town meeting. It had a tough night, but it passed very barely. It went to the ballot. It lost. Everybody had a panic attack. <laughs> We're not going to have a folk tech school to send our kids to. They made another run at it, and it barely, barely passed. So I think there's one of these things where it's good to get the public involved at the level of the ballot box so that they understand that it's, you know, 60 some odd grand a year for 20 years if the entire 10 million is raised and used. Uh, and give them a voice in whether they want to exclude that from Prop 2 and half or not. And, uh, you know, that, that could go either way. And I don't know, <clears throat> there are a lot of BVT families in this town, right? At any given moment, 20% of the high school population aged population is going to BBT. So you can't say you exactly think that because the community has a, a track record of being fiscally conservative that they may not support it because there are there's a lot of support for BBT. So in the intervening time it might be good for everybody to circle around and see what people think. We have nothing else on that. We and the last thing on our um Annual town meeting is to ratify a fire and police contract. So, anybody have any questions on that? Well, we no. got to get them to you. Um, the highlights are, mm -hmm. you know, and I've yeah. said this everywhere I've gone. The base rates are up significantly. Mm -hmm. It was a decision that we made going into the negotiations as the employer's team. Uh, so, one select board member on each, the chief of the department. The town administrator, assistant chief was was present with fire. Um, the lieutenant didn't negotiate on the police side, but <clears throat> the union provided us. Both unions provided us with significant amount of information as to competitive rates on an hourly basis for their services, and we hammered out contracts that reflect Douglas's ability to staff and pay for these positions. We're currently defaulting, I'm going to speak more to fire and ambulance at the moment, to continuing to have a smaller staff that works a more aggressive schedule, a 56 hour schedule, and giving them higher salaries, as opposed to continuing to try to provide the service by hiring more people. 
Um, that's just where we're at. That's where we think we need to be. There is just a shortage of people qualified to serve in these roles, and we find ourselves, if we don't offer competitive wages and benefits, in a very difficult spot trying to cover the shifts and maintain the advanced life support uh, level of service. So is that going to be the business model moving forward, or are you going to still continue to try to recruit to reduce that, that burden on the staff? I think our business model going forward is to recruit good employees and spend the money to educate them if they need the training to reach certain levels of uh, proficiency. Um, it's becoming increasingly obvious now that the pool is so thin that if we're considering, seriously considering people who may have questionable background and a background check or a difficult reputation, that we've reached the end of our rope, that we just can't go there. We've got to hire people to the extent that we can, people that we know, either from being call firefighters, call EMTs, or employees of another town department who have crossed over and done some time as a call firefighter. It makes more sense. If we know somebody's going to show up to work and they're responsible and they're, they're well put together, um, we'll get them through the academy. We'll get them to punch their ticket, at least as an EMT basic, so that we can staff. And on the police side, it's much more difficult. Um, because now you have to meet all of the police officer standards of training uh, requirements, not only for your training, but uh, as you go through your career, you don't have much room to make mistakes. And um, so that's gotten really difficult to find people who want to be police officers for that reason. There's a lot of pressure on the profession. I think some of the political anxiety has dissipated a bit because everybody realized the folly of trying to cut police uh, expenditures in major urban cities with <laughs> crime rates yeah, shot not a the good roof. business it was plan. Like, no kidding, they really <laughs> are d protecting you folks. Um, so that, I think that's gone by, but there still is the, the concern. Um, the job has gotten incredibly complicated. Um, and I think we're doing the right stuff here, bringing in mental health professionals that are involved in some of our calls. Um, providing that additional expertise and de-escalation experience on scene so that it's not all on the police officer by himself or herself to provide those answers. But it's an evolving profession and it's getting really hard to get people to do it. So um, we took moves that we did in these contracts hoping that the, the public will agree with us at town meeting. So with that, we're down to your report we exhausted everything else I think we're all exhausted period I think um, I'm recommend that the, the board uh, skip executive session I don't have new information to give you so at this point I'm only going to say I'm going to distribute the current status of the budget um, as it's in the FinCom flyer format and simply try to sum it all up in a nutshell and say the resources are, are available for me to roll with my department head's recommendations and requests. No one has asked me for anything that is beyond the reservation, beyond the pale of what they need to do every single day, just to make their equipment work, to keep their employees well equipped and well trained, and to pay a competitive salary. I just haven't heard that. Um, I think we are going to see some dynamic growth in library and adult social center budgets because we're beginning to serve way, way more people than we ever did at both of those institutions. So I would call attention out to circulation figures and patron figures at the library as well as the sheer number of people taking advantage of the adult social center. And Patrice is at the point now where she's limiting many activities to Douglas only. Um, I think the bus <laughs> we were laughing today, her and I, because we didn't want the bus to be a flop, so we really pushed the bus, and now the bus is, like, killing us. <laughs> because it, it was actually sold for reasons right. that we could have anticipated. We just didn't know how Douglas residents would receive it. But <clears throat> if you don't want to park far away and have to walk across traffic, 
if you don't like to drive in inclement weather or if it's going to get dark early in the winter, um, you know, now the bus comes to your house, picks you up, takes you to the adult social center. You might stay there all day, do three or four activities, have lunch. And so now, you know, St. Patty's Day is 59 people and she's turning people away and there's a waiting list. So we're just at capacity with a lot of these functions, so we have to staff accordingly. It's not a big ask, frankly. It's a couple part-time positions um, and some expenses at the library, but for the most part, um, these are two departments that have managed to run since the why am I, pandemic, the override, oh. <laughs> uh, with very little additional resources other than the director staff being in increased. So there's across the board, but the lion's share of what I'm allocating in this budget, here you go, is one, two, three, four copies. It's still going to education. You know, Douglas Public Schools and BVT taken together, a little close to $780,000 worth of the new growth. So almost half. I am still, and this will be my last note, Mr. Chairman, I am still yeah. closing the draft budget at a positive number. So I'm not balancing the zero, I'm at close to $200,000 in the black. March. So that's going to be on our excess and edit. No, no errors, errors. or deficiencies here. Errors and deficiencies. <laughs> or excess. Excess. Uh, Found money. You're distracting me. I'm trying to end the meeting. <laughs> Go ahead. Originally, we were trying to, I was trying to reserve enough of the new growth in the budget, the new revenue, to put the town in a good position in its negotiation with any potential uh, future site for a highway barn. So you wouldn't have to raise and appropriate all that or transfer it from free cash that you would have this money set aside. The trouble with that is March is good for surprises, last minute surprises. Like, oh, I don't know, the cost of a consultant to do an environmental cleanup for a fuel spill in the basement. Look, we knew it was going to cost us money, but we got the invoice today at 5 o'clock and it was a good deal more than we anticipated. That is why usually when I do the budget, I'm trying to keep a fairly substantial amount of cushion as we come down the end, because this happens every single year, no matter where, what municipality I've worked for, and it happened in the private sector too. You're just about to put a bow on the budget, and somebody comes in and says, oh, do you remember that so-and-so's mainframe computer died and it's gonna be 100 grand? I was like, ah, no. So that's where we're at. I, I have no doubt in my mind that we will be well above zero as we come to the end of the process. Um, I just want to say, I, to, to this point, I have not said no to any department head, and I've met with all of them on their requests, except for some of the smaller ones. But all the major departments have agreed with their requests. The only thing I took back, I took back 10000 from the tree warden, because I had increased it by 10000 and then when Adam had a whole bunch of, a case to be made for a whole bunch of additional things he needed, so he give me some of that 10000 back because so, so I can balance you out without hurting the budget too much. But other than that, that's where we're at. That's what we're working on right now really is just the budget and all these other items in the, the war article, so I don't know that going back over that's going to be helpful at this point in the day. Anybody have any questions for him? Seeing as we've exhausted everything on our little list, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Don't, hey, don't fight. Don't. You can stay all night, but you can't don't, stay here. Don't fight for it. But, uh, <laughs> can I have one? Lisa made a motion. No, she can't. Um, all right. Thanks, Max. Uh, second. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Uh, aye. <laughs>